Oh, welcome from Cornerstone Church, Colchester. This video gets put together every Sunday after the morning service, just to give those people who weren't able to make it uh, a taster of what happened, uh, particularly an opportunity to hear the sermon. So if you wound the clock back a few hours ago, this room here would have been full of adults and uh, young children and you can probably just about see behind me there the place where John preached from this morning. We had a lovely time together this morning after having our uh, pastries and coffee still dry uh, today and the sun is shining so it was lovely to be able to gather in the garden and then we came in here and we sang and prayed and heard God's word read and the younger ones uh, heard the story of David and Goliath continuing our series in um, the stories that we can see in the Bible that particularly show how God saves, how God saved his people. And then we had a reading which I'm going to read in a moment and then John preached to us from Mark chapter 6. And then finally we finished our service with uh, some prayer, time for prayer and some more singing and a time of open prayer as we all reflected on how God had challenged us and encouraged us this morning. Well, there may be a variety of reasons why you're watching this. It could be that you uh, were unable to make it due to illness or maybe that you were out looking after the children this morning if that was you thank you so much for helping out we've got some a lovely group of precious young ones and we're really grateful to you for helping uh, by teaching them and uh, caring for them perhaps you're investigating our church here uh, if that's you and you've got any questions then do email in uh, the email address will be coming up at the end of the service uh, this video uh, the minister John my husband would be delighted to uh, find out um, what your questions are help you think through whether this is the right church for you if you're moving into the area and looking uh, for a church family to be a part of I'm now going to read God's word the passage and then it'll the video will move on to John preaching so reading from Mark chapter 6 1 through to 34 he went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished saying where did this man get these things what is the wisdom given to him how are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Josie and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, except in his own hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marvelled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why this, these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, 
whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military lead commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognised them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Well, let's pray, shall we, as we come to God's word that he might speak to each of us. Father, we thank you for your gift of the Holy Spirit to your church. Lord, we thank you that it's only by his power that I can speak anything helpful now. And it's only by his power that we can understand more of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, who he is. And Lord, we pray that you might speak to us this morning, that our hearts might be refreshed, that our faith may be strengthened, that we might be those who are happy to be followers of the Lord Jesus, even rejected in this world, knowing that we journey towards a glorious world that will come when he comes. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, anybody here like being rejected? Anybody here like that experience of the cold shoulder? You know what it's like? Anyone here like friendships coming to an end, either abruptly or in that long, cold freeze of rejection, the emails not returned? No one likes rejection, do they? And unless you're slightly odd. I have to say, if, if you like rejection, you're probably slightly odd. Well, this section of Mark's Gospel is about the rejection of Jesus, uh, and he goes into more detail. We, we've already come across the opposition that Jesus has from the Pharisees plotting against him in chapter 3, verse 6, because he healed on the Sabbath and wouldn't keep their rules. <coughs> but here, for the first time, Jesus <coughs> begins to teach his disciples that they will be rejected. And it's in this context that he teaches that they and we can react to such rejection with confidence. Now I know there's quite a bit to get through so I'm going to be going quite quickly uh, but just two points. 
to help us hang our thoughts on. Firstly, familiarity can breed unbelief and rejection of Jesus. I didn't quite finish that point when I sent it round. So familiarity can breed unbelief and rejection of Jesus. And then secondly, be confident despite the loving teaching ministry of Jesus being rejected. Now, the whole section is about Jesus being rejected and the way in which he teaches his disciples. So let's just pick it up in verse 1. He, he went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? You see, Jesus clearly spoke well, uh, perfectly, in fact. People were astonished at what he said. We're not told what he said in the synagogue because Mark has already outlined the gospel that Jesus preached. Jesus preached that he was the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the one that the Old Testament pointed forward to, the one who now fulfilled all those promises of the Old Testament. The time had come. The kingdom of God was now near. And how were people to respond? They were to repent, turn away from living lives as if God's king hadn't come and trust in God's king. So we know what kinds of things Jesus would have said in the synagogue, a synagogue at Nazareth. And he also did miracles. How are such mighty works done by his hands, verse 2? So his hometown, the people who knew him, they heard perfect preaching and they witnessed miracles. And how did they react? They rejected him. Why? Well, he was just too familiar. Verse 3, is, this, is not this the carpenter or the builder, the, the son of Mary, and, and brother of James and Joseph and, and Judas and Simon? Interesting that Joseph's not mentioned because he's probably has probably died by this point. Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Well, we know who Jesus is. He's just a carpenter. The local builder, he's not the son of God, he's not the son of man, the judge of all the earth. What is he talking about? And why does he talk about God being his father when he's Mary's boy? And look at all his brothers and sisters, they're here with us. He's just a normal guy like us. And maybe like his family, they would say he is out of his mind. That's what his family was saying in chapter 3 verse 21. You see, the things that Jesus was saying meant that they thought he'd gone mad, he, he took, tried to take him in hand. But what Jesus teaches his disciples here is that this familiarity breeds unbelief. Now, we could say that this was just Jesus and his family and his circumstances, but the thing is that Jesus says, this is, this is a truism, verse 4, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honour except in his hometown and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marvelled because of their unbelief. See, the reason why he only did a few miracles there was people didn't believe that he was who he said he was. Not that Jesus couldn't do lots of mighty works, he's been doing lots of mighty works since the beginning of chapter 1. It was because people didn't believe in him. And Jesus marvelled, was astonished at their unbelief. In other words, Jesus explains the rejection of him with a truism which applies to every prophet. And I would suggest applies to Christians today. We'll think a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we enjoyed the film with James Corden called one chance sorry it was it's here on chance and i thought oh, that's not right it's one chance one chance i don't know if you've uh, seen it it, it is a, a delightful film um it's about paul potts uh the tenor who was obsessed about becoming an opera singer <clears throat> problem was he was growing up in a welsh mining village and uh, opera singing is not sort of common in welsh mining villages and uh, coming from a very sort of working class background it's a real heart warmer it shows how he was <coughs> rejected by his own parents bullied mercilessly at school in fact rejected until he made it on to britain's got talent and, and we love this kind of story don't we uh, 
the humble made good, the humble exalted. I think one of the reasons why such a story has so much power, even if people aren't Christians, is because that is the story of the world. The one who's humble, rejected, nailed to a cross, brutally tortured to death, now exalted to the highest place. You see, what Jesus is teaching his disciples here is that <coughs> rejection is part of his lot, part of his disciples' lot. And maybe, this is something I'm, I'm still grappling with, maybe we need to ask God to help us understand this more deeply in our lives. Because it's so easy, isn't it, to think that rejection is something alien to the Christian life. Whereas this would suggest it's part and parcel of following Jesus Christ. See, the original hearers of this gospel would have lived in Rome, and Christians there would have been rejected by their family. They'd have been rejected by their neighbourhood. They would have been rejected by the city of Rome. They would have been cruelly and brutally rejected by the evil tyrant Nero, who would be responsible for the execution of Peter and Paul. And in including this, Mark is showing those that their Lord and Master was rejected. Really was rejected. Even if he was the perfect Son of God, this is how the story goes. This is what it means to follow Jesus Christ. So maybe our immediate family reject our faith. They think we've lost our mind. I remember when I went home after I'd become a Christian at university, went home to my parents, and do you know what they said to me? Oh, it's just a religious phase, John, you'll grow out of it. It strained family relationships. I remembered having blazing rows with my mother because I wouldn't take Holy Communion. Because in the church that she went to, that's all you needed to do to be saved. Maybe relationships are strained in our families. We, we dread Christmas because of the rejection. Or maybe we need to be reminded it's part of the story. Or maybe we're the one who is rejecting Jesus Christ or coming close to rejecting Jesus Christ. Or maybe we need to take warning from these verses. Familiarity may be really unbelief in us. But wonderfully, uh, we know the end of the story, don't we? Uh, just as we know the end of the story with, with, with Paul Potts, and we don't sort of leave him being bullied and rejected and humiliated. No, he was exalted to that place of operatic glory. Well, we know the end of the story for Jesus. And we wonderfully know the end of the story for Jesus' family and for Nazareth. Jesus' mother saw him crucified, yes, and saw him alive again. And she was there when the Holy Spirit was poured out, as were her sons and daughters. James, the Lord's brother, wrote the book of James, as did Jude. See, Jesus' rejection is part of the story, but it's not the end of the story. As so Jesus understands the rejection we go through, he can equip us to keep going, knowing that our rejection is not the end of the story. But Mark seems to want the Christians in Rome, as, as well as God speaking to us today through this, to understand more deeply the reasons for the fact that Jesus and the prophet John and all who follow in their footsteps of prophecy, speaking to others about the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, all Christians are even greater than John. He wants us to understand why people reject us. So a second point is be confident despite the loving teaching ministry of Jesus being rejected. Now this is the theme of, of the, the section. It's, it's a mark and sandwich. It may not be that appetising as a sandwich, but it, it's, it's a, a, a visual aid of what's going on here. You've got the bread and the filling. And the bread relates to the filling. Where's the bread? Well, have a look at verse 7. He called the twelve and begin to send them, uh, sorry, I've, I, I've missed the, the little bit of bread. Uh, second half of, of verse 6, can you see it? It's sort of set apart. And he went about among the villagers teaching, and he called the twelve, 
uh, and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority. And, and then at the end of this section, you have the same in reverse. So verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. And the end of the section is um, in verse 34. And he began to teach them many things. So Jesus' teaching ministry delegated to the apostles. The apostles go out. They're rejected. They come back, tell Jesus, uh, as, as well as teaching and healing and proclaiming the gospel. They come back <coughs> and then Jesus has compassion on <coughs> the crowd because they're like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. Do you see, do you see the bread? And that relates to what happens in the middle, which is this section with Herod. So the compassionate teaching ministry of Jesus is delegated to the apostles and they spread his teaching ministry, included the power to heal and cast out demons. And this is what Jesus says to them as he sends them out. Verse 8. He charged them commanded them to take nothing for their journey except a staff to ward off wild animals, no bread, nothing to eat, no bag, don't carry lots of stuff with you, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. You know, yeah, okay, you can wear some sandals to stop your, your feet getting uh, worn away on the road, but, but don't expect to stay overnight outdoors. Jesus is telling them to be confident in God's provision. He doesn't say, plan well, pack a bag, make sure you've got your wallet. <coughs> he commands them to go out with confident trust in the Lord's provision. They won't need to sleep outside. They'll be taking in to people's homes. And he said to them, verse 10, whenever you enter a house, stay there until... You depart from that. In other words, don't, don't be choosy. Trust in the sovereignty of God. Develop relationships with the people with whom you are staying. Give them opportunity to listen to the message, but also expect rejection. And if any place will not receive you, verse 11, and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Shaking the dust off your feet is equivalent to handing them over to the judgment of God. The apostles were to be so confident that when they went out, they trusted God for provision, and when they were rejected, it was God that was being rejected. Not just them. I think, well, that's the apostles. You know, they, they, they were the apostles. But let's not forget, how does the apostles minister? We've just... Uh, declared our faith in the creed, haven't we, that we believe in one holy and apostolic church. We are an apostolic church. Remember how the Great Commission was given to the apostles, and how the Great Commission was given to the church in Acts, and how the baton is passed from Paul to Timothy to elders and deacons and pastors and shepherds. See, we're all involved in this work of being disciple-making disciples and the role of pastors and teachers is to continue the apostolic ministry. The man of God is to do the work of an evangelist. So it's not that the apostles were some kind of unique, yes, they're foundational. We're not apostles, but we're part of an apostolic church. We, we have the role together of bringing the gospel of Jesus to the world, and so we can expect what they expected provision of God and rejection. They go together. I don't know, a number of us here I know like walking and hiking. What do you expect when you go hiking? You expect blisters, don't you? Or some, some discomfort in your feet. We know it's part of the journey. We're not masochists. We don't sort of, sort of grind our feet into the ground trying to get blisters. It's not, it's just part of the journey. Or if we play sport, we, we expect to get hurt every now and again. I had my thumb dislocated. I wasn't quite expecting that. Or, you know, but, but you're not sort of masochistically, I'm not sort of going around whacking my, my thumb. Or, or um, maybe some people play football like this, but, you know, trying to scythe everybody down. No, no, that's not <coughs> the point of the game. The point of the game is to get the ball in the back of the net and, you know, occasionally you get injured every now and again. If we go to work, we expect frustrations, exhaustion, 
as well as satisfaction is part of the journey. Now I'm preaching this to myself as well as to us. In our comfort loving age we need maybe to be reminded that if we're followers of Jesus rejection is part of the story but it's not the end of the story. See, if we expect rejection, if we expect opposition, and when it comes, it won't deflect us, will it? It is hard, but believe you me, it is hard. But maybe, I don't know what noise that is. Um, I don't know if I need to switch something off, Sam. Is that? That's okay. Um, it, it, it's part of the story, um, but maybe we hear very frequently that Jesus is our substitute, and that's right, Jesus died on the cross in our place to take the punishment for our sins that's vital important but he's also our example we walk his path he is the author of of the path that we're following he, he's he's the trailblazer I've, I've thought a little bit of how we might put this i mean people have, have, have said this kind of thing before no suffering no glory, no rejection, no rejoicing. In other words, if we're not willing to be rejected for our faith, do we think that we're going to be part of a church which is seeing people come to faith, given that the way in which Jesus brought people to faith, the way Jesus saved people was partly through his rejection. Yes, his exaltation, his resurrection to glory, but the cross came before the glory. Rejection came before joy. See, it's so easy if we're dominated by our culture's preoccupation with comfort to think that if we're rejected, somehow we stuff up. Don't, don't you feel that? So if only I could have told somebody the gospel in a better way, then they wouldn't have rejected me. If only I could have lived a more godly life, then that friend, who I've had for years, who just has had so much of my Christian stuff and has cold shouldered me. If only I could have done that better, but no rejection is part of the story. If the perfect Son of God, sorry Sam, do you want to? Yes, sir. If the perfect Son of God was rejected, do we really expect that we won't be? If the apostles were rejected and all of them were executed by one, do we think that if we're going to have a powerful, fruitful church ministry that there won't be any kind of opposition or rejection? No, no rejection, no rejoicing. Maybe why in, in, in the book of Romans, as we were thinking about rejoicing and weeping, Paul mentions within a hair's breadth of one another, where to rejoice with one another, where to weep with one another. So be confident, despite the loving teaching ministry of Jesus being rejected, we somehow need to encourage one another, don't we, that rejection is not a bad thing. Yeah, we don't want to be masochists, but it's, it's part of the story of people being saved. We want people to be saved. We need to be willing to be rejected. But the other thing that, that feeds our confidence is understanding where rejection comes from. And this is why I think this story of King Herod is here is to show why King Herod had a problem with John the Baptist, which extended to his beheading. Let's pick it up in verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. In other words, the public ministry of the apostles um, meant that um, King Herod heard about what was going on. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah. And others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod <coughs> heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now, just as an aside, this is a strange thing to include in a gospel. Why has Mark included this, a apart from teaching us the reason why people reject God's prophets? Well, I think one of the reasons, and we perhaps don't realise this, that the Herodians, 
Herod. These were powerful people, public figures. And what Herod could not deny was the power of Jesus. He, he couldn't say, oh, well, there's, there's nothing powerful going on. He came up with a, a, a spurious explanation. He says, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. He, he's saying that somehow John has been raised from the dead, and that's why and Jesus is actually John the Baptist, and that's why all these miracles, all, all these amazing miracles are happening. In other words, the early Christians took the testimony of their enemies as being reliable testimony to the power of Jesus. Now, if, if you're interested in finding out more, you could always read this book. Well, I haven't read it. But uh, this is what N.T. Wright says about this story. We may guess that the story circulated in early tradition and was included by Mark partly because it provided a lead in to the story of John's death, but equally because, though Herod was obviously mistaken, it was noteworthy that Jesus had attracted such attention and that such outlandish explanations were being given for his extraordinary powers. In other words, nobody denied that Jesus was doing powerful things, that his followers were doing powerful things. Even Herod believed in Jesus' power, the one who was involved in executing Jesus. But Marx wants us to see the confidence of John as a prophet and the reaction of those in power to him. See, why had John been put in prison? Why was there opposition to God's prophet? Verse 17. Look at it with me. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. See, John the Baptist's PR company would have gone apoplectic. You don't criticise in public the king. You don't call out the king for his immorality. You don't say, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. God's prophets are not called to be mealy-mouthed political manoeuvrers. And Mark includes it here to prefigure what will happen to God's prophet, the one like Moses, the son of God, who will be executed by a cowardly ruler, Pontius Pilate. But, but, but where did Herod kill John? What was going on inside Herod that meant he was so opposed to John? Well, he'd married Herodias. When push came to shove, Herod preferred to listen to the person he slept with over the person who created him. See, it's nothing new that our, our sexual lives are one of the key motivating factors in rejection of Jesus. And, and, and Mark wants those in Rome who are reading this to realise that there's, there's secret motivations that we may not know as to why people reject us, but, you know, let, let's just check that this is what he's teaching. Verse 19, Herodias had a grudge against him, that's against John, and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. John, John is preaching to King Herod, and Herod knows us something about this guy. He, he speaks for God. But the problem is, Herod loves his sexual behaviour more than he wants to go God's way. And the fact that John puts his finger on that in public... Well, this is his Achilles heel. It's Herod's Achilles heel, isn't it? Because verse 21, an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. Most commentators would say that that was a fairly sensual dance. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Now, it's not the only thing that's going on in Herod. He's clearly full of himself, and in his arrogance, he, 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 he promises something he doesn't want to deliver. But Herodias goes out, and uh, she asks her mother, what, what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on the platter. On the platter. See, Herod is caught between two things he loves. Herodias, his wife, 
an immoral liaison, and listening to John the Baptist as he proclaims God's truth, well, which will win? Add in his reputation, he, doesn't want to, he wants to save face in front of all his military commanders, he wants to be the strong man. Well, there's no contest, is there? The king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her, and immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. Why are God's prophets opposed? Why are they rejected? It's not because there isn't a, a reasonable explanation, a rational, intelligent exposition of why Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You know, if people want intelligence, they can read that book. No, it's far more simple. People think with their gonads, to put it bluntly. That's how people think. That's why they rejected John. Of course, there's much more. So we are to be confident, despite the loving teaching ministry of Jesus being rejected, uh, the loving teaching ministry of, of anyone who follows in apostolic doctrine, because it puts its finger on what people want to live for, rather than living for God. That is why you and I will be rejected. It's not just an intellectual thing, it's a moral thing. Well, as we close, how can we, I think we need to be thinking about this, I think we need to be praying individually, and, and for me too, praying, how do we ensure that as a church, yes, we have a domestic focus, but that we're not missing out on that public, courageous, prophetic ministry. Yes, we need wisdom. And you might be thinking, well, you know, to be honest, John, well, I can barely keep, get to the end of the week um, and, and, just, and just keep going. How, how, how are we going to sort of take on this load, this, this expectation to be rejected if we're more public in, in our speech or in, in what we say? Well, this is where we end. Uh, in the section. The apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. And what's Jesus' response? Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. So maybe in, in preparation for us taking the next step, whatever it might be in our lives, the first step is to be with Jesus. A desolate place is sort of shorthand for a, a place of prayer. Jesus would go to the desolate place, places to be with his Father and to pray. So there are times of outward public ministry and inward private restoration. Let, let's be committed to, to both individually and as a church. Let, let's plan to do both. Let's, let's be thinking ahead towards Christmas and, and being more public, expecting to be rejected, passion for life. But let's find time to be restored by Jesus, to allow him to work in our hearts so that we might know and really believe, and I struggle with this, that with no rejection there'll be no rejoicing. Unless we're willing to, to preach the gospel, to communicate the gospel in a way to friends, family, whoever it might be, yes, there might be that initial rejection. But it's only through that that they will in time come to know him. And then we have the joy of people being born again, believing in Jesus, of turning things around, be it in our families, our neighbourhoods, our work colleagues, our city, our nation. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so sorry that we look at the teaching of your word and uh, your encouragements and your warnings uh, that we will face rejection Lord, forgive us for shying away from that Lord thank you that you didn't shy away from the rejection that you suffered ultimately going to the cross knowing the joy that lay before you and Lord please help us to walk that same path help us not to be foolish and just bring rejection upon ourselves but Lord help us to be those that are confident trusting in your power to provide and your power to bring people to a knowledge of yourself even through our rejection so Lord we commit ourselves to you afresh and ask that you would strengthen us by your spirit to keep teaching 
what Jesus taught with compassion. For your glory's sake, Lord. Amen. Amen.